Hello friends, it's kind of subpar, at least according to my three baby mamas. So, not too long ago, Otstarva made a video on the absolute hellscape that is solo queue. From inconsistent matchmaking, putting you up against a P100 Wesker who needs a 4k to feed his family, right after a brand new trapper who just got off his 9 to 5. To your own teammates conspiring against you. Solo queue just sucks sometimes. Trust me, the survivor main who solo queues almost exclusively. But how bad is it really? I recorded my last 278 matches just to one-up the man himself, a few of which I streamed on my Twitch, mostly for footage since I don't own a capture card. 278 matches is a pretty solid sample size, so here's what you can generally expect from your solo queue games. I also grossly underestimated just how long these games would take. If this, if this video flops, oh god. Keep in mind that I started recording around halfway through the Blood Moon event and finished right before the DS buff, so things are subject to change as perks are updated, killers are buffed and nerfed, and new stuff is released. First, let's start off with the perks. Perks can literally make or break any single game, and there's a lot of them, 255 perks in total if I'm not mistaken. But not all perks are created equal, ranging from, ah oh yes, my teammates also leave scratch marks, to yanking myself off of this meat hook. On the survivor side, I counted 3,246 total survivor perks. Because yes, I counted each and every one. We'll make it, two will make it, kindred. Not including my own of course, I tried to be a control of sorts, bringing objectively powerful builds and absolute doo-doo ass and everything in between. And the same can be said about my performance. Out of these perks, the most used was Windows of Opportunity, seen 256 times. Adrenaline was a close second at 245 uses, and Resilience got bronze at a flat 200. Checking out the top 10 and comparing it to DVD stats from last year, the lists are pretty relative to each other aside from a few outliers. I put way too much time counting each perk, so if you want to see every survivor perk and how many times it was used, you can pause the screen now. Not too unsurprising, if you play more than like 10 matches, you have a general idea of what you will and won't encounter in most of your games. The types of perks, however, are kind of all over the place. The only thing that was pretty consistent here were the exhaustion perks since they're generally regarded as some of the best and tend to bring consistent value. But as you can tell, exhaustion, info, second chance, and altruistic perks all crack the top 10. And if you pay close attention, you'll see that I didn't encounter Pharmacy, Rookie Spirit, Visionary, Up the Ante, or Collective Stealth a single time. And sure, some of these just suck or get outshined by other perks, but getting beat out by like, Spine Chilled is crazy. But the opposition is just as important to note. Out of all games, I ran into Hillbilly the most at 29 times or 10.4%. Wesker, Huntress, and the Unknown were close behind with only one U separating each of them. And rounding off the top 5 was the Skull Merchant. I don't love this killer, but I just can't find it to completely hate her. I wonder where that is. Here's how often each killer was encountered. Funny enough, I only saw the twins in like my last 10 matches, and it was the same guy two times in a row. The Dredge and Xenomorph only having one encounter each was a bit surprising to me, since the Dredge is one of the best things behavior has done for DBD aesthetically, and the Xenomorph is the Xenomorph and is a powerful killer overall. But whatever man, this is cool too, I guess. Gazillion percent. Loser! On the killer side, the most used perk was unsurprisingly Pain Resonance at a whopping 117 games. That means that nearly half of all matches played had Pain Res. Do keep in mind that I counted 3 survivors for every killer, so Pain Res being at 117 is proportionally higher than Windows being at 256. And you won't believe what came in second place. Pop goes the weasel at 95 uses. Then there's a steep drop off to third place, which was Lethal Pursuer. Again, pause the screen if you want to see every perk I encountered. There were less total perks on the killer side, so that left a lot of perks out, which unsurprisingly included real gems like Deathbound and Hoarder. So with what you're most likely to encounter out of the way, why does solo queue suck so bad? Most issues can come down to a general lack of communication. With absolutely no way to know exactly what your teammates are doing, planning, or thinking, you can end up in easily preventable situations that can cost you the game. Behavior has done an amazing job at mitigating some of this by updating the HUD, now allowing to see whether your teammates are doing a gen, healing, or f*** all. But there's still scenarios where the HUD doesn't quite cut it, like who should go for the save, ran by a hex totem while in chase, I'm on death hook, come take a hit, do I think voice chat should be a feature? I'm uh, not so sure. People online are the worst. But there's definitely still steps to closing the gap between solo queue and survive with friends. Like showing your teammates builds before the game starts, or base kit kindred minus a killer aura reading. I tallied up 41 matches that I called solo queue moments, where one of these preventable situations occurred simply because we had no way of communicating with each other. Not every single one resulted in a huge loss, and some happened when the game was practically over, but these are also just the ones I saw. Considering there are three other survivors, I'm almost certain it happened way more. 
13.7% of matches had a player give up, 28 of which were survivors and 10 were killers. Haha, <laughs> easy, new baby killer quits and we win. But since the survivor role is team based, an early DC can lead to an unwinnable and one sided game. 10% or 1 in every 10 matches is an uphill battle where the odds are stacked up against you from the very start and it just feels horrible. Unless it's Gold Merchant, then I'll let it slide. And of course, DVD isn't DVD without the server crashing every once in a while. But you know what else feels bad? Toxicity, camping, tunneling, you know. I tried being very generous with what I consider toxic and tunneling since it's pretty debatable, but teabagging and smacking on hook is kind of whatever. I only counted 4 matches where genuine toxicity occurred like slugging the whole lobby and refusing to hook, or messaging after the game. Tunneling and camping was a lot more prevalent. There was recently an anti-camping mechanic that allowed survivors to unhook themselves if the killer is too close for too long. It's extremely forgiving, however, to prevent survivors from abusing it, but that leads to it being damn near useless at certain situations. Not to mention some killers like Huntress being able to completely ignore this mechanic. I counted 34 games in total where a killer blatantly tunneled or camped but the number would definitely be higher had I been more lenient with the definition of tunneling. Although camping and tunneling can be used strategically in certain scenarios, it can definitely lead to really unfun and uncounterable situations depending on your resources, perks, and of course, teammates. Like with the HUD, Behavior did a good job at making bar time base kit, making tunneling a lot harder to do, and it should probably stay the way it is now. I know it's a bit of a hot topic, but the mere existence of the DS buff should be enough to deter hard tunneling. The anti-camp feature could use some tweaking, especially when it comes to basement camping since the killer can still camp near the one entrance without the meter going up too fast. And also ranged killers like Huntress and Trickster and even Wesker should have some feature that stops them from camping from afar. What exactly could that be? I don't know man, I don't work here. Despite the prevalence of camping, tunneling, and early game quitters, you might be surprised to hear that all gens were completed in nearly 58% of all matches. This of course still includes games where everyone died or where killers let everyone escape, but gens were completed more often than not, and that definitely opens itself up to an interesting discussion on just how important gen slowdown is on killer. As annoying as it may be to face pop and pain res over and over and over again, gens were still completed, albeit slower, and escape still happened. Replace this meta build with some silly perks and the game definitely would have ended much differently. But then you can make the argument that chase oriented builds could lead to faster downs and faster deaths, but that's a whole different discussion. Most games resulted in a 4k, go figure. If we use the general community's logic, we can say killer won 48% of matches, survivors won 36% of matches, and there was a tie 16% of the time. 18 of the one man escapes were via hatch, 2 of those being my own, and I escaped a total of 99 matches. I died. A lot. So is solo queue really that bad? I don't think it's nearly as bad as it's made out to be. Yeah, you might run into a very similar batch of killers running similar builds, teammates refusing to help, tunneling, and the sorts. But for every bad play or poor experience, there's a fun and surprising match that's only amplified by the fact that the people that you're playing with are complete strangers with no set game plan. Okay, maybe not for every bad play, but you get the idea. Objectives were still completed very often, and over half of matches I played resulted in a respectable two or more of us escaping. Solo queue and its problems really aren't any more or less prevalent in DVD than it is in other games. Not to say that there isn't anything to improve, because there is, but inconsistent teammates and opponents and no or poor communication isn't something that's exclusive to DVD, but just something that we have to deal with when we boot up a multiplayer game by ourselves. You can lose to a really good killer, or because your teammates suck, or your perks didn't help in the situations you were in or whatever it may be. Just know that and run it again. And I'm not saying that solo queue is like this cheat code and you're just gonna go win all your matches. I mean, I gave you the stats, chances are you and the people you're queued with are gonna die, but you'll probably find yourself enjoying and relaxing a lot more over this game. Just knowing that solo queue is very difficult and having that it's just a game mentality will help you out a ton. Or like Matthew Cote said, you can play another game. <laughs> or find friends to play with. Swifts can admittedly be more fun and are usually much more organized, but considering you're watching this far into the video, that might be hard for you to do. Thank you to See Through Tooth for making this thumbnail, and the next vid is on, uh, Pokemon, I guess. <laughs> I'll see you guys later. Loser. W. I didn't see where the gates were. I see one over there. <gasps> is this it? Is this the one? Fuck. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I make it. Take a hit for a girl. <gasps> oh my god. Oh my god, we did it. I'm teabagging. <laughs> we 
we did it. That's the one. Oh my god.